think we'll be starting in just a moment. Make quite a good uh, pub quiz team, I would say that though. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Watts. It's really nice to be here for uh, Earth Live lessons, and I have to say a big thank you to Liz Daly for asking me to do this full stop. Uh, my name is Simon Watts. I've got a really weird career. I think they called portfolio. Um, the personally, I kind of think of it as failing in many directions at once. I write books about science, I present documentaries about science, and I go into schools and do things like even a bit of stand-up comedy talking about science in most cases, and mainly kind of about my love of the natural world. And when I say the natural world, I actually do mean things like those creatures there, uh, in particular this little fella, officially the ugliest animal on the entire planet. Um, no wonder he doesn't look quite so happy about it. Um, but as this has to be kind of on a bit of a topic, I, I've been thinking actually maybe it'd be a good chance to talk about why some things look the way they look, because I don't know about you right now, but I'm feeling a bit rough. As you can see, uh, if you look at my face, I've been recently growing um, a mistake. This is a kind of lockdown beard, which is grayer than I remember it when the last I had one. It's, uh, you know, I just kind of figure if there was a time to let yourself go, this is probably it. And so the thing is, Things look the way they do for a reason and for a purpose. And I think in that case, I'm going to talk a bit about colour and pattern and stuff like that. Uh, this is not exactly going to be blue chip in terms of my documentary style this time, because I've deliberately had to kick my um, kids and my wife out for their designated hour of exercise in order to nick all their toys to explain some of these things to you. So let's start. Nature. Majestic. Beautiful, red in tooth and claw, and sometimes, fair enough, a bit minging. Most things are kind of coloured the way they are for a purpose. One of the most common ones that we probably understand is camouflage. But camouflage does not simply mean blending in. No, it can mean having sort of patterns of stripes and maybe spots and stuff like that in order to try and break up the outline. A solid block of colour would mean that the animal would stand out much, much more obviously. Perhaps a good example of this is our favourite pyjamaed horse that we all know, the lovely zebra. The story of the zebra's stripes, though, might be a little bit more complicated. Those black and white stripes might exist for a completely different reason. It might also be for trying to keep parasites off. There seems to be something um, in those stripes, in the high kind of contrast that seems to happen, that means that flies, things that are going to be coming down and sucking the blood, can't land on these stripy horses quite as easily. It also does break up the outline and I think makes them look a bit dapper. But it's not just stripes. There's lots and lots of stripy things out there, but you might also see that there's lots of ones like this, which are stripy for a very different reason. Um, Hans Zimmer does his best work. We focus in on a flyer. We hear the cello soar, because that's kind of what cellos do, and then flies a bee a wasp, and something else that's vaguely kind of black and yellow, but not a JCB, maybe some kind of poisonous uh, moth, which has used the same coloration. What we're looking at here is what we call malarian mimicry. Basically, these things are all dangerous, and they've all decided to use the same colors, so that's basically stupid uh, predators will not have to learn more than one color to avoid. So the wasp, the bee, and lots of other things have decided to go black and yellow. It's one of the more obvious ones. They share the burden of educating predators. If something was going to come along and try and eat one of them, it does eat it. That one's dead, but it's now learned. I'm not going to go anywhere near anything like that. So that's malarian mimicry. But this advertisement is so effective. Um, it's kind of like maybe, I reckon, it's a bit like, uh, you know, your standard sort of football hooligan who's gone for the skinhead kind of look. Um, they all sport different teams, but by looking dead hard, 
they all share that kind of that symbolism. So we now look at those kind of people and think, oh, you look dead tough. You could probably be one of the two actors in EastEnders that I can remember. Anyway, it's not just these that use the kind of black and yellow coloration because they are dangerous. Lots of things like, say, Hoverfly will also color, copy this coloration. They look virtually identical. They're not dangerous, but they get all the advantages of looking dead hard without having to invest in the biochemistry, which allows this to happen. Now, the problem is your copy has to be less common than the things that it is copying. Otherwise, nobody would trust this advertisement. I see we just got a live question as to what is the ugliest animal in the world. I can tell you that one very, very easily. It is officially uh, the blobfish. I know it's officially the blobfish because we did it democratically. We asked people online, we had a vote. Um, it went a bit Boaty McBoatface, but that's exactly what we were looking for. We were trying to find what was the most sort of hideous animal on the planet that was endangered. I was looking for an anti-panda because everybody knows the panda, everybody knows the snow leopard, everybody knows the tiger and the polar bear. Not everybody knows creatures like this. So my book's actually got 60 different ugly endangered species. All of them need our help. You love that face? Me too. And why wouldn't you? I mean, like, no wonder it's looking depressed, because this one's, well, this one's particularly sad looking because it's particularly dead. Um, if you're a fish and you're out of the ocean, of course you don't look your best. The whole point, though, is the same, that all of nature deserves a little bit of help and a little bit of love. And we shouldn't really be so shallow in what we like, I think. So I run the Ugly Animal Preservation Society, where I get to talk about all these things. Anyway, back to stripiness. So, you find lots of things which are nice and stripy to try and scare things off, be they dangerous or not dangerous. Bits and mimics copy things that look dangerous, they get all the benefits of looking hard without having to invest in the chemicals and things that make them dead hard. Uh, you sign this an awful lot in terms of uh, stripes and things and camouflage, particularly in the sea. I think perhaps the best family of camouflage and stuff are the octopuses. Now, octopuses, the cephalopods, the squid, the cuttlefish, they are so effective at being able to hide because they have instantaneous camouflage. They don't use hormones like things like um, the chameleon. Instead, they've got direct uh, electrical signals. They can use their nerves to switch their color. I mean, like, look, this one's about to switch color. Oh, that was fast, wasn't it? It's able to do this. Uh, we watch as the camera then zooms in, it starts playing a bit of post-rock for a bit of difference, something Icelandic maybe. And you find little cells like this. I'm going to pretend that this is an iridophore something which is all sparkly. This means that they're able to control the brightness of their environment and react to it. But they've also got chromatophores. Now chromatophores are basically cells that have got muscles around them and are a little bit stretchy. And this means, should they need to hide, they can just stretch those out and change colour pretty instantaneously. I think they're the masters of camouflage when it comes to that kind of thing. But as we said, camouflage is a little bit more complicated than just fitting in. A lot of things go for what we call countershading. We stay in the ocean right now. If you look at something like a whale, you'll probably notice that it's darker on the top and lighter underneath. And you'll see, of course, the exact same pattern if you took something like a penguin. You even find it in the land as well. All these things are using what we call countershading. Countershading is basically where... Um, you're darker on the top and lighter underneath. Because if you're looking up and you're looking into the light, then you want to be able to hide in the, among the brightness. Whereas if you're looking down, you're looking into the dark. If you're something above, like floating on the top of the water, you're looking to the depths and into the darkness. So you're looking for something that'll be a, uh, you want to be able to hide like that. Uh, we've got another question in from Sarah on Twitter. Why do humans think that animals are ugly in the first place? Because we're shallow, because um, we're boring, and because we're actually kind of very mammal-centric, the real key is we have what we call the kinder schema, um, the baby schema. We are so pre-programmed to looking after children, we are so maternal and paternal as a species, that we kind of add that to nature. And the creatures that we think look cute are the ones that are fluffy, so they've got kind of soft outlines, they look a bit babyish as a result. They've got huge eyes, something like a slow loris, in the same way that sure enough a baby has a slow eye. I think that most of what we find cute is our shallowness, but also that it's, we're being hijacked. Uh, we're having our instincts of looking after something small and cuddly, taking advantage. So we think some things are really, really nice, just because we like babies. Even if you don't like babies, it's probably in your hard wiring somewhere deep down. Cool. Um, where was I? Ah, 
Another thing to think about if it comes to that is eye spots. The camera zooms into a lovely, beautiful meadow and in flies some butterflies. Now these butterflies are not camouflaged. You cannot say that they do not stand out. They've got this beautiful coloration. In some cases it is an advert saying, I am poisonous, don't you come anywhere near me. But you'll still see quite commonly lots of butterflies, regardless of the species, regardless of how they're related, they still often will have eye spots on their wings. And these eye spots are perhaps to try and direct something like the beak of a pecking bird away from the dangerous bit of the body. You can afford to maybe lose a tiny bit of a wing, but not all your internal organs. Or it could well be that because you've got these two things spread out, it just looks like a large face staring back at you. You're not going to think that you're going to creep up on this moth or this butterfly because you think it's looking directly at you. This is a technique we've seen also in some snakes. For instance, there's a species called a monocle cobra. And the monocle cobra has got an eye pattern on the back of its head. This means that when it's flared up and it's looking forward and looking for prey, it still looks like something uh, is creeping up on it, might be being watched. Um, if any of the kids out there have got parents who claim to have eyes in the back of their head, the monocle cobra pretty much actually does. It's not a real eye, but it looks like one, and this is enough to maybe put off any predators that are going to chance it. I think a more extreme example might be even to look at some caterpillars. So this caterpillar here is the pink underwood moth. And not only has it got its eyes up on its actual head, on the back of its head it's got another eye pattern which looks, to the eyes of some predators, a little bit like a snake. I like something will put it off. But colour means more than just camouflage. Colours and patterns also have got a purpose of trying to look um, pretty. It is trying to look attractive. And perhaps one of the places we see that the most is when we look at the birds. Uh, birds are gorgeous with their colours. Think of things like superb starlings or even the blue tits and the robin breadbreast that you might see in your very own garden. Those colourations are an advert saying, come and get me ladies. It's usually the guys that are the bright colourations. They're trying to advertise how healthy they are and what fantastic mates they'll make and what kind of great genes they'll have. So let's have a quick look in here. The camera pans up through the trees. Hans Zimmer does something really good. There's more cellos, because there's always cellos. And we see some of the bright, beautiful colours. I picked this toy of my kids deliberately because it's got that gorgeous orange. And actually, back when I was doing my master's dissertation, I was looking into these orange colorations caused by what we call carotenoids. The camera zooms into the picture. Has a closer look at the fellas. Carotenoids are great antioxidants. They're one of the ways that you can keep your body nice and healthy. They're one of the chemicals which were used to try and fight against the symptoms of age and disease and keep your immune system going fantastically well. If a bird can afford to shove loads of nice coloration into those feathers, it is a sign that it is doing so, so well in life that it doesn't have to have them in its immune system. So the carotenoids are one of the very good examples of this. If you see a really brightly coloured bird, they might well be showing off that they've been so good at getting some of these uh, foods into them in the first place that they can go so far as to waste it. So, that's just some of the reasons why things look the way they do. Um, basically, everything looks the way it does for a purpose. Evolution has been doing it since the year dot. Uh, it doesn't matter what we think of something. If we think it's beautiful or if we think it's hideous, it is the way it is for a very good reason. Have we got any more questions? If not, I'd like to take you through a couple of my other uh, favourite ugly animals. So, you were asking about the, uh, the blobfish earlier. The blobfish is officially the ugliest animal on the planet. We know this because there was a poll. Um, it is pretty hideous, but again it is adapted and looks the way it does for a reason. It has a great deal of fat in its flesh. And this fat that's in its flesh means that it it's able to kind of float. It doesn't have a slim, swim bladder the way that lots of other fish do. So this kind of way, if you pour uh, oil onto water, you'll see that it floats and stays up on the top. The blobfish might well be doing something very, very similar. Um, the second ugliest animal in the world is actually officially the kakapo. Now, Google it. A kakapo is not ugly. It is a flightless parrot, and therefore my mate Steve Mould, who's arguing for it, he said, it's a flightless parrot, ergo, it's a rubbish parrot. Okay? It's officially the second ugliest animal on the planet because the people of New Zealand were just so pleased that anybody was talking about one of their favourite species that they got on board. And we got in all their newspapers and all their things and everybody voted en masse. Um, 
I see there's a couple more questions coming in, so I'm going to do my best to answer all of them. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay, so here we go. Ah, question from Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Um, what animals are in the Ugly Animal Preservation Society? Well, it's anything which one of our members thinks looks ugly and is in some way endangered. That is the key. The whole reason I set the thing up in the first place was to try and get people talking about conservation more. I was hoping that people would be able to make this part of a daily conversation. Our planet is in such a bad state, unfortunately, at the moment. We're sleepwalking into the sixth extinction. And it just means that I think we have to talk about things more and more and more. We've got to talk about them in new ways. I use comedy. And the Ugly Animal Preservation Society was set up as a comedy night, first and foremost. And now I take it into schools and festivals and things like that as well. And write books and articles and make YouTube videos and things about it too. But the core of it was that I think we don't... We, sincerity shouldn't be our only weapon. I was taking the laws of satire and applying them to conservation. We make jokes about politics because politics matters. I think we should make jokes about conservation because conservation matters. So the whole purpose is just to talk about any animal. So if you think it's ugly and you think it's endangered, go out there and try to bite it and it's automatically a member. As we tour around, different places elect their own individual ugly animal mascots. So for instance, uh, Glasgow elected the pig-nosed purple frog, which looks a bit like a second-hand fruit pastel. Um, Edinburgh went for the gob-faced squid. The poor creature didn't even have a common name until we named it, uh, and now it's in Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, London is the proboscis monkey. You might know of that incredible Gerard Depage kind of nose. Everywhere we tour, we get people to elect their own ones. We've had one even abroad now. Um, we've had ones in Korea, where they elected the blobfish as their mascot, and Sofia in Bulgaria, where they elected the griffin vulture. Uh, that is not an endangered species globally, but locally, there it is. And so people were likely just enjoying being the chance to, uh, to talk about one of their own local endangered mingers. Okay, uh, then we've got, there are more ugly animals than humans. Well, I think some humans are pretty ugly. You can see this beard isn't really helping me out. Um, but I think our ugliness is inward because it's, it's this shallowness. We should try and do our best to look after our planet for pure selfish reasons, if nothing else. We live here. I'd quite like to pass on a nice world to the next generation. Though um, I once heard a very good phrase, which I think sums it up quite well. We're not leaving a better world for our children, so we need to leave better children for our world. Hopefully they can do something that we haven't. Emily D has asked, what is my favourite animal? Uh, again, that's one of the reasons I set up the society is because I was, I was doing um, a TV show at the time called Inside Nature's Giants and we had a book tour. And I noticed as I would tour around, people would always ask me what was my favourite animal and then look disappointed as I'd spend the next sort of 10 minutes talking about ants. And then I'd have to spend another 10 minutes sort of ranting at them and telling them why they're so... They're missing the point of conservation if they only like the the good things. Um, so I think, generally, ants. Now, there's lots of different kinds of ants. My new favourite is the Dracula ant, which sucks the blood of its own children. I mean, how incredible is that? Yeah, gross, but pretty incredible. Um, but ants invented farming before we did. They've, they've got war, they've got slavery, they've got all those nasty things as well. I think if you want to see Game of Thrones and an insect, go look at the ant world. Uh, oh, we've had another one. Do I think the good-looking animals are conserved more? Uh, yes, and not only do I think it, we have proof. And there's been more proof even since I set up the Satirical Society. Sure enough, some people who were in our audience have gone off and done PhDs in this exact thing. It seems to be that if you're a mammal, you get way more conservation attention and you even get more research. We understand those animals better so we can understand what plights they might be facing. If you're something like a slug, people don't tend to care quite so much. So we can say it's true. And even your name can have uh, effects on your PR. If you've got the name rat, the word rat in your name, you're way likely to get less conservation attention. There was a paper that came out in Australia a couple of years ago showing that any of their local endangered indigenous wildlife that was called rat didn't get half the amount of research. Let's see, were there any more questions? Because I want to do my best to answer all these. No. Okay. Well, look, if you do have any more questions, please just get in touch. Um, I'm not a big tweeter or anything, but you can find everything I do at 
at Simon D. Watt dot, uh, well, at Simon D. Watt on Twitter. I'm on Facebook as well. And check out my website, www.simonwatt.co.uk. Or if you want more about the ugly animals as a whole, go to uglyanimalsock.com. We had big, big plans for this year that we were going to be going to the Fringe, uh, but obviously that's been cancelled. And it was going to have the world's first ever International Ugly Animal Day. Um, so keep an eye out for that next year while we'll be doing it. Uh, Tom L, you want to know how do we get involved with the Ugly Animal Preservation Society? It's a bit loose. Um, participation is membership as far as I'm concerned. If you do something good, you can call yourself a member. But again, as of next year, we'll be working on making things like badges and stuff that you can freely download yourself. Come to one of our shows, but more importantly, give to maybe some of the charities and things that I support. So for instance, I work a bit with On the Edge Conservation. Um, they are looking at the edge species. It stands for evolutionarily distinct, globally endangered, and most of the ugly animal species I talk about fall within that remit. They're ugly kind of because they're unique. We think they're surprising because they look a bit different. Um, and the World Land Trust, who take a very interesting approach to conservation, which is they buy land. They acknowledge that thing, that if you look after the habitat, the animals and plants tend to look after themselves. Um, we are not a charity. Sometimes people think they are and try to donate to us, and I point them off to the people who do actual real good work. Um, I'm hopefully good at chatting, so I make chatting my life instead. Anyway, look, it's been absolutely lovely talking to you. This has been an Earth Live lesson. Thank you, Lizzie, again for having me. Sorry for all the technical difficulties that we had, but I hope this has been worthwhile. All the best now. Bye.